Securing your data doesn't just mean securing it from hackers, but disasters as well. Hard drives fail. Computers crash. Houses can catch fire and burn. Chances are, all of us at some point in our lives will lose some of our data completely irrevocably. But there's one good way to avoid all of that. Having a backup. First, let's distinguish between a backup and an archive. An archive is what you do to free up disk space while still keeping copies of older files by moving them to some kind of alternate storage medium, usually offline. But if you lost that particular storage medium, the external hard drive or whatever it was put on, then you've lost your archive data, unless you've also backed it up. A backup is a redundant copy, so you have two copies of your files in different places. So if something happens to the storage medium, or a file gets accidentally deleted or corrupted, you have another copy. It's this redundancy that makes something a backup. Let's also distinguish between disaster recovery and fault tolerance. A backup system is disaster recovery. Fault tolerance is something you can do to help prevent a disaster to begin with. A common method of fault tolerance with hard drives is called RAID, Redundant Array of Inexpensive Drives. RAID is where you have your data spread out among separate physical devices, even though it appears to your operating system as one logical drive. So it might still appear as your C drive, but be several different physical hard drives working together. There are seven levels in the RAID standard, but we really only need to concern ourselves with four of them. RAID 0 is called that because it's not actually fault tolerant. Your logical drive C might be spread across two one terabyte drives, giving you two terabytes of space. That's called spanning. But a failure of either of these drives would cause the failure of the entire logical volume. You can use as many drives as you want, but even a single device failure will destroy the entire volume. If you're using this for temporary storage that you don't need to worry about keeping, then RAID 0 can give you a speed advantage, since while data is being written to one drive, other data can be written to the other drive simultaneously. RAID 1 is the first level that gives us fault tolerance. Here we might have two one terabyte drives, but in this case, our logical volume only has one terabyte of storage capacity. Whatever gets written to one drive gets written to the other as well, which is called mirroring. If one of the drives fail, then the other one can keep going while the first one is being replaced. RAID 1 won't give you any speed increase when writing data, but it could give you a performance increase while reading data, since half the data can be read from each separate physical drive. RAID 5 is a very popular method. This is where data is spread across more than two drives with a technique called striping. Let's say you have three one terabyte drives. Each of these drives will be divided into three sections, and each section combined with its corresponding section on the other two drives is a stripe. One section in each stripe will be used for a kind of error correction known as parity. Remember the XOR operator back in part one? This will tell you whether two bits are the same, resulting in zero, or different, resulting in one. So the two data sections are XOR'd together to make the parity section. If either of the two data sections are lost, it can be reconstructed based on a combination of the parity bits and the remaining data. RAID 5 uses distributed parity, which means that each stripe will have its parity information on a separate physical drive. This is to even out the wear and tear between drives, maximizing the life of the array. If these three drives are one terabyte each, then our logical volume will be two terabytes, the remaining terabyte going to the parity data. So we're losing one third of our data to error correction. But RAID 5 doesn't limit us to three drives. There isn't a theoretical maximum. If we have five one terabyte drives, then they're divided into five stripes, with the parity data for each stripe on a separate drive. Now, our 5 terabytes all total will give us a 4 terabyte logical volume. Again, the remaining terabyte left for error correction. If you XOR more than 2 bits together, the result will be 0 if there are an even number of ones, and 1 if there are an odd number of ones. If you lose one of the drives, again, it can be reconstructed from the parity information. You just look at the other data blocks to see if they have an even or odd number of ones, and then look at the corresponding parity block to see what you're supposed to have. This will tell you if the missing bit should be a one or a zero. 
With RAID 5, you always lose one drive's worth of storage space to the parity data. But the upshot is that you can lose any one of the drives to drive failure, and the rest of them can keep the array going while it's being replaced. Access time is also greatly increased, but writes can be slowed down a bit by the parity operations. And finally, there's RAID 6, which is similar to RAID 5, except that each stripe has a second parity block. With RAID 5, you can lose any one of the drives in the array and keep going, but if you lose two, you lose the whole volume. With RAID 6, you can lose any two of the drives, but a RAID 6 array of five one terabyte disks will only have a three terabyte logical volume, the remaining two terabytes being used for parity. A simpler way of putting it is, however many drives worth of data you lose to the parity information is the number of physical drives you can lose and still keep the volume going. Again, this is fault tolerance, not a backup scheme. If something happens to the array, your data is lost. If you accidentally delete a file, it still gets deleted, and if a file gets corrupted, the array faithfully records the corrupted version of the file. So while this can help reduce the need to have to use a backup, it is by no means a replacement for one. Backups are about making separate copies that aren't actually linked. The strategy most often recommended is called the 3 one backup strategy. This means that you have three separate copies of your data, two local but separate, and one off-site. The first copy is the normal copy on the disk that you're accessing anyway. You'll want a second copy of your data on site so that if something happens to one, you can conveniently access the other. And you'll want one copy off-site, because if something happens such as a fire that destroys both on-site copies, you'll still have the off-site copy, even if it's less convenient. One way to have an on-site backup is simply with an external hard drive, and you just copy your files over to the drive, say, once every day. That works, but it's better if you use dedicated backup software. A good one is Backupper from AOMEI, but there are many others. Backup software can help you out by keeping track of which files have been backed up and giving you options for keeping multiple backups and going back to earlier versions of your data files. When backup software makes a copy of every single one of your data files, that's called a full backup. You could just make a full backup every night, but consider this. If you have 100 gigabytes worth of files and you're copying them to a one terabyte external drive, you can only keep 10 days worth of backups. If that's enough for you, fine and dandy, but you might want more. And if you think about it, there's really a lot of waste there. Most of that 100 gigabytes will be the same from one day to the next. So you can also do what's called an incremental backup. Let's say you make a backup scheme where you make a full backup every Sunday, and then every other day of the week you make incrementals. So Monday night, you back up every file that's changed on Monday. On Tuesday night, you back up every file that's changed on Tuesday, and so on. Depending on how many files you change and what size they are, you could keep backups going back months with this method. But there's a trade-off. While you can still go back to individual versions of files just as easily, say, Tuesday night's copy of a certain important file, if you ever need to restore all of your data files, it'll take longer. You need to restore the full backup, then the first incremental, then the next incremental, etc. So to do a restoration on Thursday, you need to restore the full backup, followed by the three incrementals in order. So there's another method, the differential backup. The differential backup backs up every file changed since the last full backup, regardless of whether or not it was backed up by a previous differential. So on Sunday, you do a full backup. Monday night, you back up everything that changed on Monday. Tuesday night, you back up everything that changed on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday night, you back up everything that changed on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and so on until the next full backup. The upshot is that you only ever need the full backup and the most recent differential. The trade-off is that as the days go by, the differentials will become larger and larger but it can give you flexibility with managing your disk space. If you know for sure you won't need Monday's copy of any of your files, you can delete Monday night's backup, since those files are also in Tuesday's backup. But although you could always go back to Sunday's backup, you'd lose the flexibility of going back to Monday's particular version of the file if it was changed again on Tuesday. 
Good Backup Software will let you automate all of this and automatically fire the backup each night when you're finished using the machine. It will also encrypt your backups since you wouldn't want someone to be able to steal your data just by stealing your external hard drive. Backupper uses industry standards PBKDF2 and AES to turn a password you select into a strong encryption key. But understand, this is fully TNO. If you forget your password, you can't restore your backup. But that only deals with on-site backups. Remember that you'll want at least one copy of your data to be off-site. But this can be done easily. All you need is a secure location to store a hard drive. It could be something like a safety deposit box, or it could be as simple as your mom's house. If you go over there every Sunday for dinner, you could just say, Hey, Ma, is there a safe place here I could keep a hard drive? Then every time you went over, you'd bring your external hard drive with you, swap it out for the other one, and bring that one back home for that week's backups. So even if the worst happened, you'd be able to go back to the previous week's backup with a hard drive at your mother's house. But it might be worth it to invest in a proper off-site backup service such as Carbonite. Carbonite has plans to start at just $5 a month, paid annually, for unlimited storage for a single Windows or Macintosh computer. It's automatic and secure, backing up your files as they're changed throughout the day. Carbonite will store up to 12 previous versions of a file, going back as far as 3 months. And if you have at least a Plus membership, they can send you your backup on an external hard drive. Carbonite backups are encrypted, but they aren't TNO, unless you get a business account and you elect to manage your own encryption key. If you do that, you'll lose a lot of features, such as remote access of your backup files and courier recovery. And of course, you'll lose access to the backup if you lose the encryption key. And like we discussed with cloud services, Carbonite also has HIPAA compliant plans. Now, when we talk about backups, we aren't talking about backing up your OS installation and its applications. The idea is that you can reinstall your OS and your apps and then recover your data files from your backup. It is possible to back up your OS, but it means backing up your system disk. The best thing to do is to have your data files on a separate physical drive. If you've done that, you can back up your system by making an image. See, your OS installation isn't just files on a disk. It's all sorts of things, like the master boot record and the partition data. An image backs up all of that. Some backup software, including Backupper, can backup drives and partitions sector by sector and can even support incremental and differential backups where it backs up only the sectors that have changed. This will let you recover quickly from a catastrophic failure, but understand that if the reason for the failure is because of a virus or some other piece of malware, then restoring from the image will just put the virus right back on your system. You'd need to restore from a backup old enough to have been made prior to the infection, and a lot of times, that can be hard to track down. Backups are a crucial part of disaster recovery, but we haven't by any means covered the worst that can happen. What happens if you're in a coma and your family has to get the information they need to pay your bills? Or what happens in the event of your death with all of the information needed by your heirs? That's what we'll cover next.